Fantastic. Every fantastic. Actually, um, I'm very pleased to be here. It's Brenda Rogers here, the training manager at uh, Young Living, and uh, tonight's a business topic. And I really want to talk to you about sales because uh, it's something that it's kind of challenging for some people and yet it's what we really want to know more of. So uh, I'm pleased you're here. There's so many of you on and we're going to have a little chat tonight about sales, that salesy thing. And hopefully that has an impact on you and what you're trying to create in your life. So let's get started and give you an outline of what we're going to be covering today. So we're going to have a look at, let me just press, um, okay, so understanding what selling is and what it's not. You're going to become aware of your own feelings towards selling. We're going to learn five basic principles of sales and they are not what you're imagining. So fantastic. We're going to understand the importance of talking about benefits its features and benefits. We want to talk about benefits. We're going to recognize the importance of authenticity. So in a nutshell, we're going to look at um, learning the basics of selling and feel free to interject with comments uh, along the way. I will be checking the chat box to just moving things around the screen so I can, um, so I can, so we can engage with each other and, and you can participate and that way you learn a lot more. So please get your fingers ready and type in uh, and I'll do my best to respond and interact with you as well. So let's get started. What is selling? So we're um, talking about what is selling and I really like you guys to enter something. What do you think selling is? What's your definition of selling and perhaps, you know, what is, you know, the classic definition of selling or the horrible definition of selling? What are some of those things that are um, maybe putting us off as well? So just think about it. What is selling to you? Sharing your passion, says Holly. Yeah, persuading somebody to purchase, persuading being a good word, uh, providing a good service that is potentially desirable to others, yeah, promoting a product, yes, filling a need, yeah, perfect, uh, product in exchange for money, very good, education and addressing needs, I call it edge-selling, Meredith, I call it edge-selling, so we're educating people um, to help them find what they need. So, yeah, so some of the answers can be convincing someone to buy products, uh, but selling really should be a way to facilitate a transfer of information and an understanding of the value and not that sort of convincing, overly persuading. I mean, persuading is a great word, but we don't want to push it. And then um, what is selling? So it can be a presentation of new ideas and products. It can be a conversation or an exchange. It can be a qualified recommendation. So you're actually almost prescribing, like in clinic, I might prescribe something. And so I'm in that way I'm selling. It can be connecting people to value. And you guys really get that already because I think that that's the young living way of doing things. But it is really about, enjoyment it should be enjoyable for you and for the for the for the buyer and for the seller because we're all both really aren't we and what is what is selling not so what is not selling well i'm going to answer that for you it's not about the clothes it's not all about the clothes not getting people to sign the dotted line. It's a lot more than that. It's not trickery and tactics. It's not special offers and deals. It's not alienating people. And it's certainly not being pushy or dishonourable. None of us really like that or want to be that. 
It's never about getting people to buy what they don't want. And I think that's where the uncomfortable feeling comes from because we've all experienced that, that buyer's remorse afterwards and we think, why? Why did I do that? That's very, very common and very typical, but I think that's more an advanced concept. So we won't be covering that in detail today. It's never about getting people to buy things they don't want, but we need to find out what they do want. So how do you guys, how do you feel about selling? Let's be honest here. When somebody asks you what you do, how do you answer them? How do you feel? How do you feel? I'd really like to know your answers. What do you feel about sell selling? You love it. Michelle loves it. <laughs> it's a full-time job. Good on you, Michelle. We could, we could have you included in our webinars next time so you can help us all. Natasha says, oh, just that selling thing. A lot of people. Yeah, so you educate. Yeah, Meredith's conquered it. She's got it. Trying to match people with their desires. Yeah, it's a lovely way of thinking about it. Providing a choice. Yeah. Terry says, you never sell, only share what you love. And that's obviously working for you. I tell them to share my passion about essential oils. Yeah. Once I've embraced it, it's all good. Find solutions to their problems. Fantastic. Fantastic. And what about people perhaps in your teams? Um, yeah. So you're in the best business. What about people that are new to Young Living who maybe are a little, uh, you know, not sure about this selling thing? What kind of typical things? Anxious and unsure? Yeah. Yeah, that's very common, Cynthia. Yep. And some people just like, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. Yet they're doing it all the time. It's like, no, I don't want to, I don't want to be one of those kinds of people. So we need a different perspective, don't we? Excellent. All right. Well, let's have a let's have a think for a second. Are these people selling? Oprah promoting a cause, a strong cause that she feels passionate about. Is she selling? Yeah, absolutely. And Steve, when he was on the planet, yeah, selling the iPhone and the convenience of a different way of communicating huge difference that that company has made to the world nelson mandela our next one selling the idea of racial unity to both black and, and white people in south africa to eliminate apartheid that's definitely that was a huge sale that he had to make over many many years and then we have Martin Luther King Jr. selling the ideas of peace, equality, justice, especially for African Americans and the socially disadvantaged. And then we have Gandhi. So Mahatma Gandhi selling the concept of resistance to tyranny through mass nonviolent civil disobedient. I mean, think about it. When your husband asks you to marry him, you know, was that a sales transaction? Was that, yeah, was, that was a sales transaction. We're uh, selling, our, selling ourselves in some way. So whether um, we're, we're always selling, whether it's ourself, our thoughts and ideas, our credibility, our values. And uh, some, sometimes if you think about a story, a story is, is a, a sales technique in a way. And uh, I think that Mastering the storytelling skill can be absolutely amazing. But the only difference between salespeople and everyone else is the salespeople gets paid to sell and the rest do it for free. So we might be selling a movie that we saw. That's a common example that we use. So we're all selling. Selling is part of our regular communication. We are Selling when we ask for a favour, when we recommend a restaurant or a movie or a, anything online, an, an electrician, a naturopath, an oil person, we're selling. Tell our kids that bedtime is now because a good night's sleep will make them happy tomorrow. <laughs> we can be highly effective that, at that and highly ineffective too sometimes. 
or when we're reassuring someone that everything will turn out all right. These are all versions of a sales um, transaction or a sales communication. Yes, the kids diffuse, diffuser will certainly help um, support that action, that sales action when talking to the kids. So let's talk about um, the five principles of selling that really help people enhance their skills. So we're going to start a conversation about being interested and authentic. So let me ask you a question to, to type in the answers for me. So why, why does selling start with being interested and being authentic? Why is it so important? Connection, absolutely. Building trust. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. So here's one of the best sales tools ever written. And it's understanding the importance and of the principle in selling with integrity. So this is a quote from, um, from Dale Carnegie. And it's become genuinely interested in other people. So sounds easy, doesn't it? Sounds really easy, but it's not. <laughs> it's a skill to develop for most of us, if you think about it. So let's break it down. Let's just break it down to, to the individual words and consider it. So become. Becoming interested in other people can be a challenge, especially when you don't think you've got anything in common with them. How do you manage that? And let me just get my, my scroll back. Um, how do you manage that? Well, becoming is, a, becoming is a transformative word that causes you to be different than you may be by default. So um, sometimes we're struggling with ourselves. We've got our default. We want to just speak to people who are like-minded. Um, and we want to speak to people who are nice. And yet we have this challenge here to become interested in all people, everyone. I'm just reading your comments. Building relationships, empathy, yeah. Yeah, fantastic. Big Al. Yeah, really listening. These are some of the skills. And then let's the second word here in this statement, very simple, brief statement, but very powerful, is genuine. So it's not about pretending to be interested. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. People can see, people can tell. So it should be done with this with the right intent. So it's really generating it from the inside. This this um, being genuine to others and to yourself. And in the long run, people will see through if you aren't really interested. You can't truly listen if you're not uh, not present and not genuine. So being interested in is this, is the um, the third component of this statement. Interested in. So ask questions to find out about them. Consider that other people are interesting, and you'll discover that you're right. So have that intention to start off with, and look look for common ground. So then there's other people in this statement, other people. There's more to the world than just yourself. It's when you become interested in other people that they will then take an interest in you. And if you're wanting to learn more about this, then the, um, this book by Dale Carnegie, uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People, is, is an amazing tool. And if I'll just give you a brief synopsis of that uh, of Dale and, and the book. He was born in 1888 in Maryville, poor, travelled as a, a, as a salesman before teaching public speaking skills at a YMCA. And he was soon lecturing to packed out houses and collected his lectures into books, which is how, win, how to win friends and influence people came about. So I'm going to let you, um, that's a classic. I'm sure many of you have read it. Is anyone who has read it and found it brilliant? Anyone not read it and, and haven't really been compelled until now? Yeah, 
gosh, reading it at the moment. Fantastic. Elizabeth, me? What do you mean me? <laughs> Haven't read it yet. Well, it's a great tool also if you're a team builder, and I imagine you're on this call because you're a team builder. It's a great tool to be able to give people that are in your team that are perhaps uncomfortable and really want to do selling with integrity. Yeah, you need to get it. Yeah. Donna says it's a sensational read and it's something that you can just have with you all the time. Some of these books are just classics that we have to have as part of our, our um, core resources. Yeah, fantastic. I know there's so many books to read, isn't there? <laughs> there's always more. Okay, so, so let's delve more into the idea of being interested in others. So we're going to start with the premise that everyone has a fascinating life story to tell. And they really do. If you hold that, that as a belief, you will look for evidence for it rather than the opposite, which is what we often do. And especially those who are maybe um, young, you know, the, the younger that we are, you, this can be a bit more challenging. I think um, when you've traveled the world, it does open your mind and you become aware that there's so much more out there. If you haven't traveled the world, then this might be a little bit more challenging for you. Not necessarily, but it, uh, it certainly does change your mindset once you've been to third world countries or um, poverty stricken countries, for example. So, um, so if you want to start with the opposite premise, premise that people are inherently boring, which I have to admit I have in the past been guilty of that, uh, then it's, uh, that's what you'll find, of course, because that, that's what we do. We create our own reality. So either way, people turn around and become really what you're looking for. So uh, before you try to solve someone else's problem, take the time to find out about them and focus on them. It's very easy to go into fix-it mode. But it's a trap and one, one that really will compromise your selling. So if you have your, if your, a very good idea is to track, track your sales statistics, to track the number of appointments that you're having, sales conversations with you have, that you're having, and then therefore the number of conversions as well. And if you're finding that your success rate isn't that great, then one of the things that to, to write down, to become aware of in yourself is whether you're in fix-it mode, whether you're trying to solve people's problems before you've even understood them. And uh, if you spend a whole lot of time talking about yourself and your interests, you won't ever find out about them. So not learning out about others from a sales perspective gives you no insights into their interests, their motivations, and their emotional drivers for making decisions. And it will affect your statistics. So check out your statistics. If they're not that great, here's one thing to possibly work on. Uh, we wanna ask questions about their family, their background, their interests, their hobbies, passions, and concerns. Many of us have learned the acronym FORM, F-O-R-M. And a little challenge for you, uh, family is for F, O, O is for, type it in, for those of you who know, who've already read some of the reason, reason, occupation actually, yeah. Of course, people want to talk about their job. What do you do? It's a really common question. What work are you in? What line of work are you in? It's, it opens up huge conversation in many instances. And then we have the R. I think there's a couple of different, depending on who you learn from, a couple of different uh, definitions for R. Yeah, re recreation. Recreation. Yeah. It, yeah. I've heard, it be, I've heard it say relationships as well, but I guess we can cover that in family. And then M. I've heard a couple of definitions for M as well. What do you correlate with the M in our acronym form? We form people. Your message. Yep. Or it can be money. Both those I've seen as well. It can be your message. So your um, 
now addressing their interests and concerns and values. Or it can be, uh, if you're in a business conversation, it can be uh, inquiring about their financial situation in a very diplomatic way, of course. So a lot can be learned about an individual and their background. So there are also easy, fairly easy things for mo most things to talk about. The form things are easy things for, for people to talk about and they start conversations quite easily. So from there, we want to probe with questions to get a, a, a deeper and deeper understanding and to think about what we're hearing and try and uncover their values. And that might be a... Um, that uh, might be inquiring specifically about um, the why. I suppose one of the things that I've learned in the coaching course that I did with Nikki Kiyohoho, which I highly, highly recommend, was absolutely brilliant. But there were um, we were dis discouraged from asking why questions because many of us have been barraged by why questions, particularly in growing up, and it can, can, can quite easily become um, a judgmental question. And we were encouraged in this course to ask what questions or how questions. So instead of asking them perhaps, why, why do you like what you like, into the, insert the word, the thing that they like, you might ask, you know, what is it about that that you like? See, it's a softer way of asking that same question. So we're also uh, looking for common ground. And uh, people are attracted to similar people. And as you find out about others, you have a high chance of un uncovering common ground. And this becomes one of your initial points of connection. So there's that word that somebody mentioned um, previously we're trying to get a connection. And when there's something similar, then we get the connection. So spend time listening. And don't think about what you're going to say next. Just focus on listening and remembering. It does take focus. If you find that you're not a great listener or listening skills is something that you need to develop, then I highly recommend meditation because we need to train our mind to stay on topic. So you'll know how good you are at being a conversationalist by becoming aware of how often your sentences start with I or my, indicating that you're talking about yourself. So we need to drop the ego. So principle number one is be interested, be authentic. What's principle number two? Listen four times more than you talk. So carrying, carrying on or following on from our previous principle, we want to listen four times more than you talk, which kind of, you kind of need to have this sense of watching yourself when you're talking, being the observer. And that's where meditation can really help. Meditation develops that observer part of us. And so if you find yourself doing something trying to sell and it's not working, then we need to develop that skill of being the observer. Yeah, <laughs> definitely need to work on that. Okay, good. So Rebecca reminds herself each day, nothing I say this day will teach me anything. So I'm going to, if I'm going to learn, I must do it by listening. And that's Larry King on your vision board. Fantastic. What a commitment that is. Awesome commitment, Rebecca. Tricky to stop talking, it really is. It really is, especially if there's those uncomfortable pregnant pauses. <laughs> so, we're, um, so we're introducing the concept here of talking four times more, listening four times more than we talk. And I guess that's important, but for what reason? What, why? Okay, so we learn when we ask questions. And if you're talking, you're, you're learning about what you're, yeah, gaining information. So you'll learn, if you're talking, you're, you're teaching somebody what you know, but you're not gathering any information. So I guess the exception to the rule would be if you're providing specific information that, as, um, that it's asked of you as a sub subject 
matter expert. So if they, they've asked you a question. And even then, it's probably safe to say that you're likely to provide more information than is required. But sales are rarely made based on superior information and typically on positive feelings towards the product and the person selling the product. So that's why these principles are the foundation, the fundamentals for selling. And they really need to be, these five principles are like the pillars, they really need to be solid for you. And uh, rather than trying to sell, if you focus on learning to listen, learning to be authentic and real, learning to be interested in them, then your sales will just come automatically. People love to talk about themselves, Sue. Yes. And that builds trust when you're a good listener. In fact, I think all the um, relationship gurus say the one skill that you can learn to be extraordinary in your relationships is to learn to listen better. I think we can all do that better. So asking questions and listening. So how to spend 80% of your time on listening. So in reality, you will likely spend more like 20% of your time talking. But aspiring to the 80% is a great goal to have. So how do we do that? We ask lots of questions and they ideally are the what, how, when questions rather than the why questions. So listening actively and providing uh, this encouraging body language, I think most of us really understand that. Observing their body language. So you're looking for signs of interest. So you're leaning in, nodding, smiling. I mean, if they're looking away, they won't make eye contact, then you're not getting them. They're not, they're not with you. Encouraging them to go more deeply into a thought or an idea or a story. So use statements like, wow, what happened next? Tell me more. How did you feel? What did you, what did you learn from that? Would you do it all over again? So you see how there's no why questions here? They're what and how and so on. So if you're talking, then you're not learning, not just not listening, you're not learning. So principle number two, listen four times more than you talk. I hope you're writing these things down. So Jan says, ask open questions and not closed questions. Yes. Questions that can't be answered just with a yes or no. We could practice on your kids, practice on teenagers because they are, the, they are great, great place to practice, especially teenagers because if you ask a closed question, you'll get a nuh. Sometimes when you open an open question, you'll get one too. But <laughs> um, All right, so principle number three. Talk in terms of benefits over features. Oh, my goodness. This is challenging. Easier said than done. So why is it important? Type in for me. Why is it important to talk in terms of benefits rather than features? Think about it. Let me know. Busy, busy fingers. Everyone out there listening, there's lots of you. Oh, my goodness. Fantastic numbers tonight. Yeah, to give them a why. Yes, what's in it for them? If a person realizes they can benefit, they will be interested. Compliance, yeah, a healthy life, connect to their why. How to help them solve a problem. Yes, exactly. Helps show you, show why you need a product and how it will work for them. Absolutely. So, features are interesting, but they're not compelling. What's that? What's that site that? Um, statement that we say um, facts tell stories sell so we're in the same um, area here with selling benefits features are objective but benefits are subjective they're emotional and then features are generic but benefits are personal and we really want to get personal to be able to meet their needs correct Rebecca Awesome. Help them understand, definitely. So let's use an example. 
So we have, for example, lavender. What are the features of lavender oil? Uh, it's powerful and it's versatile, generic. It, the seed to seal processes, process focuses on quality, still generic. Yes, great feature, but still generic. Uh, it has a concentrated potency. You only need one drop. A key, it's a key ingredient in many essential oil blends, still features here. It has a sweet floral aroma. So still, we're still in the realm of features. What then are the benefits of lavender oil? Now we do need to, to be mindful here of compliance. However, let's have a look at an example. Let's have a look at an example. My apologies. <laughs> Let's get to this one here. It acts to calm and soothe. We know that it's calming and soothing, which enhances relaxation, as well as helps to relieve tension. Still all in the realm of features. And then what's our benefit? Allowing you to be yourself if you're feeling stressed. I mean, isn't that what emotional resilience is? Isn't that what resilience to stress is? So what other benefits can you come up with that turn that calming and soothing feature into a, a benefit? So yes, relaxing, but relaxing is a feature. Calming is a feature. How can we turn this into a, give me an example of some benefits. Here, I'm getting you, I've got your, you've got your thinking cap on now. What are the benefits of being relaxed? A good night's sleep. Exactly. Perfect. Help you have a better night's sleep. Help you feel great when you wake up in the morning so that you can be, um, so that you can be energized for the next day. Help you relax to, yeah, a happier person, yes. Feel better all over, yes. Ready, yep, sleep, help you sleep. More available to your family, thank you. Now, we're, now you guys are thinking. We can't use the, the, uh, the, the A word, Mariette, and, uh, and others. because we're um, moving into the realm of diagnosed conditions. So we don't want to connecting with our children. Exactly. When you're relaxed, what does it offer people? What does it open up? Being able to connect more, being able to be present, being able to get the job done, being able to not be a busy rushing person, being able to be effective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Help you focus, absolutely. When you're present, you can focus. But if you're stressed, are we stressed? Are we present when we're stressed? No, we're not because we're too busy worrying about things. We're, we're um, yeah, I guess we are anxious when we're, when we're stressed and we want to calm down, but, but we're, you know where it, where does fear live it's not in the present fear is in the is in the future worry is in the past and so uh, the beauty of the beautiful benefits of lavender oil being present and even just saying that it helps you be present and in the moment even just saying that people can really relate to that yeah fantastic guys you're really onto it So benefits, just to summarize, people don't buy a product for what it is, they buy it for what it does for them. So what is that, what is that quote that's out there? We don't sell, we don't sell the, 
um, not fireworks. What is it? We don't sell the, the fire with, no. Uh, I'm trying to remember that quote. Maybe you guys remember it. The fizz. We, we don't sell the thing, we sell the fizz. Anyway, it'll come to me. So people, people use features, but they enjoy specific benefits. So that's the emotional component. And when people make a decision to buy, it's usually based on the benefits that they will receive. So what's in it for them? That's why they buy. And in that case, often price is not an issue. Many of those things that we think are barriers to selling are not an issue because they've really found something that meets a need for them. Yes, we sell the sizzle, not the sausage. Thank you, Joe. That's the one. <laughs> and Jenny, yes, you've got it. We sell the sizzle and not the steak, or we sell the sizzle and not the sausage. The whole, the whole, not the drill. Thank you. Yes, we've got. To, I think that was um, Big Al, wasn't it? <laughs> Just to remember. Okay. All right, so we usually buy for emotional reasons. So just to summarise, our principle three is to talk in terms of features over benefits. Now, our principle number four, people buy for emotional reasons. We've already touched on this, but we're building from it here now. The importance of emotions in selling. So how do you observe that people are emotional shoppers? Tell me. How do you observe people are emotional shoppers? What do you see people do that's emotional buying? When they get excited, yes. How, how do you see that in reality? What, where, what do you see? Yeah. When they get excited, smile, memories. But for example, when people have a shopping list, and then they buy stuff that's not on their list. They're walking down the aisles and they want this and they want that. They buy faster. People fall in love with a product like a car and just have to have it regardless of... I mean, it's what credit cards are all about. Yes, chocolate at the till. Thank you. Very good example. That's there right there for our, our spontaneous... Last minute shopping, especially if you're hungry. They say, don't go to the supermarket hungry. Yeah, desire, we want it. Exactly. There's lots of examples of it. Credit cards are the, the killer for this. Advertising. I was watching a program on SBS the other day about, I think it's called the war on waste. And it was showing how many clothes we buy every year and how much of it ends up in landfill. And if you, there's now this sort of clothing buying addiction, impulse buying, exactly, Helen. And women, just particularly women, not just women though, go into shops and sometimes they end up in their cupboards and never even get worn. Fast fashion, it's called, exactly. Fast fashion. It's, an, it's just an epidemic. So people buy for emotional reasons. So let's have a look at that. So people buy. Why do people buy? Here we go. Some, some questions for you. Why do people buy a sports car? It's an emotional purchase. Absolutely. Why? I mean, we say cars get you from A to B. You can, you can spend 20000 or you can spend 2000 or you can spend 200000 Why do people buy? Midlife crisis. <laughs> yes, that's very good. Image. Yep, status, sex appeal, especially, you know, who? The midlife crises. I've had a sports car, but I don't think it was a sex appeal. I just wanted to be cool, I think. I had one of those red Mazda MX-5s. I loved it. Took the top off. Oh, I loved it. <laughs> to feel good about themselves. Yeah, red, red cars do go faster. I got pulled over by the police a couple of times, I have to say. But anyway, uh, why do people buy chocolate? Why do people buy chocolate? I mean, it's a no-brainer, really. Chocolate's just the best. 
<laughs> the bee's knees, luxury, emotional eating, luxurious eating, to treat themselves, the happy drug, of course, for the endorphins, the chemicals in their sweet tooth. They clearly don't need it, but they want it. And that's probably the classic difference about emotional buying. It's you don't need it, but you want it. What about insurance? Why do people buy insurance? This is, this is another one. What is the emotional uh, driver behind insurance? Security. What's the fear? We buy because we're afraid, actually. What's the fear? What are we afraid of? Loss. Exactly. We're afraid of loss. Afraid of losing something. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Sports memorabilia. Why do we buy sports memorabilia? Somebody said they're insurance rep. I'm in an insurance BDM investment. Oh, Michelle, you, no wonder you know, you know all about it. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> Anyone in the audience sports, sports memorabilia? It doesn't have to be sports. It might be you go to a concert and you buy the T-shirt. You go to a Young Living convention and you buy the gear. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Why is it so expensive? Why is an autograph worth so much? Why does it become a rarity and become valuable? A particular brand of tyre for your car, why do you buy that? Why do people buy a certain brand of sneakers? Because maybe some XYZ sports guru wears them. I know I buy, I love Apple computers just because I, I think creative people buy them, cool people buy them. And so I guess I want to be cool as well. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm winning on that one. But anyway, anything with a visible brand. You know, you know. I was at an endometriosis conference all day Sunday. And one of the lecturers was a surgeon, up at the very, very good surgeon, up at the front of the... And I noticed his shirt, very casually kind of uh, simply dressed, but he had the, the, the polo brand on his shirt. It says so much, doesn't it? Yeah, so if we wear a branded product, it tells people something about us. We want them to know something about us. So here we're starting to really get juicy about the emotional reasons by, why behind, behind why we buy things. I think we've got it. So emotions are critical to selling. People make purchases because they want to change the way they feel. Yes, they want to change the way they feel. They want to feel good. So the two greatest, mo anyone who's done Anthony Robbins, the two greatest motivators are, are anyone out there Anthony Robbins trained? Anyone? No? To gain pleasure and to avoid pain. Two greatest motivators to gain pleasure, avoid pain, or various versions of that. And we've just really summed that up. So principle number four, summarising. People buy for emotional reasons. And our last principle, principle five, customise your approach. Never do a spiel. Oh, my goodness. How do you feel when someone has just given you their spiel? What does it feel like to you? <laughs> oh, oh, I don't know. I can't repeat that, Rebecca. <laughs> you turn off. Exactly, Claire. You turn off. Yeah. You can tell. I mean, I know when I'm reading in a webinar, you can tell. I know you can. But that's okay. I do it well. <laughs> But, yeah, people, if you get the sales pitch, you know, people don't like it, especially in our business, especially. And I think in network marketing, we have to go above and beyond because people sometimes have a negative opinion of, of network marketers and they definitely don't want to get the spiel. And often they'll be interested in being with you because you don't give them the spiel and that was what they're expecting because you're more about connection you're more about caring and kindness and serving, serving them. So surprise them. 
doesn't mean we can't have scripts and, and spiels that we, we refer to and that we practice with. But when it comes to interacting with people, we can't give them the spiel. It feels like we're being sold to. It doesn't feel like we're, it makes people feel like they're just a number. It repels them. And often it doesn't really hone in on their specific needs, it doesn't answer their questions, it becomes too generic, which is what it's meant to be. So effective selling is about communicating in an effective dialogue. So when, when we have uh, conversations with our friends, we talk about different things with different people. It's normal. Uh, people have different interests. And so the same products will interest people in different ways. So you could be recommending thieves and it might be for one person, it might be for their laundry. For another person, it might be for their kitchen. For another person, it might be their, the, the sanitizer for their kids' hands and so on and so forth. It might be for, because it's chemical free. It might be because it smells nice. Um, it might be because people are, um, have heard about it before. Who knows? But we need to be specific to people. So since you're asking a lot of questions about an individual, you'll have an idea of what motivates them and what they're looking for, and that will help you. So no one wants to, be fault, uh, to feel sold to. A spiel is often about regurgitating, regurgitating the same old story to everyone and effective selling is not a one-size-fits-all thing. We need to find out what interests and motivates, motivates them and then tailor that. So you, you can, you're getting a sense here of how conscious we need to be when we're having these conversations and you can be overly conscious and, and it can really muck you up. So focusing on one thing at a time is, a, is probably a good idea. Focus on principle one first and then principle two and master each one individually. But let's just have a look at specific drivers for human beings. So understand the different reasons why people buy Young Living Essential Oils. So for example, everyone purchases for different reasons and we all have different emotional drivers. So when it comes to Young Living though, why do stay at home mums buy? Why would they buy from us? Just a couple of quick, quick answers. Why do stay at home mums buy from us? Some of you might be stay at home mums. Yeah, for their children, for their relationships, for their clean home, for their family the ease of purchase exactly because they can order online so it's not just about what they're doing for for others it's what they're doing for themselves it's the convenience of online shopping because the oils are so helpful exactly you're right on track and then why do young single people buy young living so all those all those um Facebook mums and young generation or millennials that are um, joining the business, particularly in the US and more so here and here. Why, why are they interested? Saves time for the income. They don't trust big companies. Yeah, there's some skepticism out there for quick fixes, perhaps. Yeah. And why do seniors buy from us? Yeah, why do seniors buy from us? To socialise maybe? Yep, to get themselves back up above the wellness line for community because they trust the brand. Delivery is easy for the health benefits, exactly. And then why do families buy? Daughters sell to them. Yep, absolutely. Yep, it's a whole family thing. So... Families buy because we've covered some of these things already. Families buy because, well, it's a complete package that we have for a lot of people. Um, maybe the mum's involved in the business and so she's buying for the whole family. Yeah, cost saving. I know that the Big Thieves uh, is a lot cheaper than buying products from the supermarket to keep little ones healthy, to avoid having to use pharmacy products, 
et cetera, et cetera. Excellent. Awesome. You guys are right on top of it. Fantastic. So number, pro number five, principle number five is customize your approach. Never do a spiel. Selling with integrity. So let's just summarize our thoughts from tonight's presentation. Selling in, with integrity is about connecting pe people with value. Somebody said that right at the beginning. We're connecting, we're the bridge, connecting the product to the person, the value with the person's needs. Selling with integrity is about gen being genuinely interested in others. And I challenge you to go from wherever you are, even if you think you're already interested in others, to take it up a notch, to explore it even further, to become even more interested in people. And it will cultivate that 80-20 listening, speaking. Selling with integrity is about you understanding their value because you've asked lots of questions and you've listened. listened. I'm, I'm getting tired. I'm sorry. I have some of my herbal tea. Um, selling with integrity is about you understanding emotional drivers of others and what, what helps them make decisions. Certainly the, the avoiding pain and, and you know, Desiring pleasure is a, a very useful one. And then selling with integrity is about you describing Young Living products in terms of their benefits. And that may take practice. In fact, you might even want to write down some of those benefits for the key products that you promote. So the five principles of selling, number one, be interested, be authentic. Number two, listen four times more than you talk. Number three, talk in terms of benefits over features. Number four, people buy for emotional reasons. And number five, customise your approach and never do a spiel. So sounds easy, but each one of them is in itself a whole set of skills. So I'm going to ask you, well, first of all, I'd like you to remember this. This is a great affirmation. I am an interested listener who focuses on specific emotional benefits. You might want to write yourself a little, little um, post-it note as you're practicing your sales. Maybe it's right next to the telephone when you're calling people. But having listened to today, I'd really like you to just think about your take-home message and one thing that you've identified that you would like to work on, that you're going to implement tomorrow, tonight even if you can, depending on what hemisphere you're listening to this in, what are you going to do to implement some improvement in your, because you're on this call for a reason, you've got something you want to do better, whether it's yourself or teaching others. And so we've broken it down into five principles. Practice on your family, fantastic. Emotional benefits, yeah. But what is, what, that's your take home. What are you going to do? What do you want to do with that information? Rebecca, can you be more specific? Claire says benefits in a complaint way over the, over the features. Compliant. I think you meant compliant, Claire, not complaint. Sorry. Way less talking. Okay, Jenny, you're going to do more listening. Yeah. How are you going to do that? What, what from tonight? What have you picked up on? What little technique are you going to use? Yeah. Are you going to sell, emotionally sell, Michelle? Elizabeth, sorry. What does that mean? Michelle's going to ask what, and not why questions, what and how questions. It's the why questions we want to avoid. More benefits over features and less info. Yep, you're going to speak about that. Listen more. Yep. Benefits rather than features, thank you. Be more mindful of what it is that people are needing in your conversations. Yeah, focus on the way they feel and how they feel better. So how are you going to do that? So you're going to focus, but how are you going to remember? How, what, what practice do you need first? What do you need, what's, what, what do you need to be able to, to do that? You're going to meditate. Mary's going to meditate. 
aim is going to reach out to more people because I'm not great at talking, but I can definitely listen. That's all you need. You'll share about essential oils and how they've helped you be present and have more time with family rather than cure anything that might. Yeah, fantastic. You're going to, Sarah's going to be more personal. Michelle, you're going to form. Thank you. Nice summary. Form people. So family, occupation, rec recreation, and either message or money. Elizabeth's going to practice asking questions. What kind of questions? What and how questions? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I challenge you to be more specific in setting your goal from tonight. If you've identified this is an area that you would like to be better at, then create a specific goal here with a smart goal out of what you've learned today. Great, fantastic. So if you want to know more, then I highly recommend the Dale Carnegie book, as many people have suggested here tonight, it's fantastic. And are there any other resources that you guys have found really helpful? Um, perhaps you can type them in um, so that all attendees see. And that would be Al, uh, Big Al. Big Al was a great resource. We've had him here, in fact, speaking last year. Any other resources that anyone has found? Game plan. Yep, Sarah. Uh, Sarah ha ha Hamish, isn't it? Kimmy Brook. Yeah, we had a video of Kimmy Brook and the way she presented uh, the business. So, yeah, Big Al. John Maxwell, good leaders ask great questions. Thank you, Meredith. Danny Johnson, love Danny Johnson. First Steps to Success, absolutely. And her book, she's got books if you can't get to the US or occasionally we have them here in Australia as well. Presence by Amy Cuddy. I haven't heard of that one, Michelle. That sounds amazing, Presence. And we could use Present Time, The Essential Oil. Thank you so much, everyone. I've gone over time, so I'm gonna leave it there. Thank you for your participation tonight. Really appreciate it. Hope you got some value. And this is recorded, so please look online to, uh, to, look, to, to find it and to share this with your friend. Thank you so much, everyone, for your contribution. And I'll wish you good night. You're welcome. You're welcome.